Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Pro Wrestling Report Primetime Super Show. It's the Thursday edition here on Fight TV. Thank you for joining us wherever you are all around the world. So much to talk about here live tonight on Fight, but I'm not going to be talking about it alone. We are joined, I am joined by the rest of the Thursday night Pro Wrestling Report team, including one David Octavius of Tiberius, the alleged backyard, one-time, knockout, straight-edge, hardcore, Hall of Famer hero, and also the Hurricane, Shane Helms. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you here live on a Thursday night? Man, I feel like you need to up my intro a little bit. I, I mean, <laughs> you come hard, and, and Dave deserves it. I'm not saying Dave no, doesn't deserve it. Or at least do me first then. Announce me first and save him for that main because he gets that main event introduction. So you, you just introduce well, me, me first. I'll be the sidekick. Um, this is what they call a live <laughs> edit. Hold please. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Pro Wrestling Report Prime Time Live Thursday night here on Fight TV. It's the Super Show, and it only is super because we are joined by the superhero of superheroes. The one, the very only, stand back! There is a hurricane coming to the Pro Wrestling Report primetime, Shane Hurricane Helms! That's what I'm talking about. That's a lot better. We need that every <laughs> week. Every week. <laughs> Tony Chimmel has no worry about losing his job as long as you're around, Damien. <laughs> Come oh, on, man. <laughs> oh, and the other guy, right? Yeah, there you go. Folks, uh, boys, how you guys doing here on a Thursday live on Fight TV? It feels good. You look good. But how do you feel about the weekend wrestling so far, Shane? Uh, pretty good. You know, uh, I started, I mean, uh, since we're going to talk about normally the Wednesday Night Wars, but we've added impact to the uh, to the program. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought Tuesday night was really good, and uh, Wednesday night I thought was a, a damn good night of professional wrestling as well. I forgot about Impact. That's okay. I watched it. I watched it for the first time in forever, and when I watched the cold open to the show, if I didn't know Impact was Impact, I would have thought it was either Raw, SmackDown, AEW, or even NXT. They, their, their production on their cold open was actually top-notch. Very impressed. And uh, pleasantly surprised. So Shane Helms, you you definitely called that one. Yep. We'll talk about Impact later on then, I guess. But gentlemen, we last week did be the booker for NXT's Great American Bash and also AEW's Fighter Fest Night 2. Both of those events now in the record books. And we had a substantial big news story coming out of NXT. And uh, AEW didn't quite deliver as much as far as newsworthy items but it's time to talk about both shows. So we're going to do jump ball here, which, whichever is your preference. Which show do you want to start with tonight? We'll give you the pick, Shane. Uh, let's start with AEW because they did have the uh, the big news. We got a, a champ champ and, uh, you know, big Keith Lee. And uh, I like the way that ended. I thought they told a great story. You know, if you want to talk about overall, uh, the overall show, I I thought it was really good. I got to be honest. I love Ia Shirai's promo, the promo package for her and Negan Fox. I thought was top notch. I love the Keith Lee Adam Cole match. Um, NXT I thought really delivered. No, there wasn't anything I disliked. They had a tremendous show. I thought too. It was good from beginning to end. Beginning, uh, you know, at the uh, beginning of the program, they had that hardcore female matchup. We'll talk about that in a moment. But overall, David Hero, not talking about what you picked and didn't pick, right or wrong, but your overall thoughts of NXT's Great American Bash week two, night two. Yeah, it, it just seems like the NXT stars just come across as a little more polished, a little more, I don't want to say prepared, but that's almost how it looks. But, you know, Shane, you – you missed one of the biggest high spots of the night watching Robert Strauss get run over by a tank. Oh, yeah, it's, just, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how entertaining he is. It, it's not amazing to us because we, we know him and we know how just goofy and funny he is in real life. But a, there's a lot of guys that can't translate that to a character. There are a lot of guys, Dean Malenko, right off the top of my head. He's hilarious in person. It mm -hmm. never translated uh, to screen or to a character. Um, but man, Robert Stone is just funny and he makes the most out of every single scene he's in and him screaming when he was getting run over by that little <laughs> tank, like that shit was, that was just hysterical. 
And, you know, it obviously worked because Triple H even tweeted about it. Yeah. So if you get the boss's attention on that, you know, it's great. And I'll be honest, watching that, you would think, no, I wouldn't know. But stepping on a Lego, I hear, is really painful. But, <laughs> I mean, getting run over by that toy tank, that looked really, really, really uncomfortable. And I don't know if I would have signed off on that. I mean, that's got to be the best use of a tank since DX showed up at the <laughs> WCW show, right? Were they, on, were they on a tank? What were they on that day? They were oh, that, uh, it wasn't a tank. It was like a, a armored vehicle of some sort. Yeah, when, DX, yeah. when DX showed up at the WCW. This, yeah, that, it was the been the Let's not forget, though, they did drive a tank out during, was it SummerSlam 09, whenever the SummerSlam was, where they did the whole, one of the best entrances where the stage split in half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, NXT, it just, it, it was it was a good show. It was solid. There wasn't a match like we had last week where it brought the show to a screeching halt. Um, I, I, I liked how Drake Maverick looks like he has more confidence now. It seems, it seems like he's walking taller, not to make fun of his height, but it just seems like he looks like a, a, a main event type guy walking to the ring with um, Breeze Angle for that six-man tag. That is indeed true. And let's talk about it match by match. And let's talk about the way it broke down this past, uh, just last night, rather, on the USA Network. We did be the book, if you will, for three of the matches that we knew were going to be happening as part of the Great American Bash. The first we'll talk about is a match that a lot of people are talking about. It was a street fight. And it was Candice LeRae going up against Maya, Mia, Maya, Mia. Uh, Mia. Yeah. Mia, Yim, and uh, well, that one was a barn burner, a Pier Six, a Donny Brook, if you will. Candice LeRae getting the win in that matchup. Both of you thought that Yim would win that match, or you would have booked it where Yim would win that matchup. She didn't. Candice LeRae did. Still a great match, very entertaining, great start to the show. Shane, what do you say in detail about this matchup? Yeah, I mean, I'm not upset at all about Candice LeRae. I mean, I thought, uh, and I can't remember exactly the wording last week, but I think uh, Dave and I both were like, this could go either way. We might have gave the slight edge to Mia. But uh, the way this played out, I thought was great. I love the finish, seeing as how I'm the one that brought the avalanche neck breaker to the business, uh, them to do it uh, uh, with the utilization of the table onto that stack of chairs. Uh, that looked brutal. Uh, it's really well done. Um, so, Hats off to those to those ladies. They beat the shit out of each other. And it, I mean, it was really well done. Huge what? finish. Huge finish uh, off the top rope into the pile of chairs. Both selling tremendously, making us, letting us know just how much they just went through in that matchup. Something that's void from a lot of wrestling. And actually watching them side by side, NXT and AEW, that was very, very vivid of how WWE stayed with it, how NXT stayed with it after that matchup to let us sink in and just enough time to wonder why we're still watching them lay there, but then yes. realize, oh, they really just did a lot. It gives us digestion time. I thought it was a really stark difference between two broadcasts. But David, oh. what did you think of that matchup? What I thought was fantastic is even when it was the picture in picture, you still saw the girls selling. Like, they weren't popping up and getting out of the ring in the next match. You saw them through the commercial break, slowly getting up, slowly being helped to the back, selling the effects of taking that off of the top rope, off of the table, and onto all the chairs, which, oh my, when was the last time we saw any selling at all like that on any wrestling program? Uh, but, yeah, it was very physical. I thought both girls just, like <sighs> – when I saw how that match was going, I'm like, it's going to be a long night for AEW because you don't want to change the channel when you see something like that. And uh, the girls opened the show, delivered 110%, and I think that's why NXT edged out AEW last night. I haven't seen the ratings, actually, did they? Well, obviously, you don't ever check your messages. Yes, they did, actually. Not right now. You yeah. mean you shared hot news and I didn't copy? I did. Oh. Well, 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 what were the ratings, Mr. Newsman? You know what? The numbers aren't – I don't know them up. But it was a thing like a 40 <laughs> or 50. Heck yes. You said – I'm looking at the messages now. Raw did a 1.6. That's so all you – Click on the link ahead of that. I don't click on your links. They always crash my phone. Well, that one won't. So <laughs> – 
Yeah. A solid start. Uh, a solid start for uh, NXT for sure. Great American Bash worthy matchup. But the next match that you guys had pre-booked, if you will, was a six-man tag team matchup. And it was it was the team of Breezango going uh, tagging with Drake Maverick to take on El Legando del Fantasma. This, too, I thought was a fun match. It Drake showed fire and drive and energy. The opposing team was also very, very engaged, super athletic, very, very well defined. And Breezango came with some fire as well last night. A good matchup as part of the Great American Bash. Shane, you both, you and Dave, had picked Breezango and Drake Maverick to win the matchup or would have booked it that way. That is what happened. But what did you think of the way the overall presentation was made? No, Drake Maverick got pinned. God bless it. <laughs> uh, he got pinned, and I like the way that – I mean, I think this was another one, too, that we were going back and forth on what we would do. Uh, I like that uh, – I don't – I like what they're doing with Santos Escobar. I think he's one of the best heels uh, maybe in all of WWE right now. You know, he just – he looks like a heel. He works like a heel. Uh, his two henchmen, so to speak, not – they're going to have a little bit of tr trouble finding themselves as heels because they their styles are traditionally babyface. DJ Z, you know, he's a high flyer, and his his offense is always kind of pop worthy. So, um, both of those guys, I don't think they're exactly comfortable right now in a, being in a heel role. It might help that uh, they got the NXT loyals out there uh, at ringside and not traditional fans. That's definitely helping, but. Um, it was a fun match. Brazango uh, looked great. I love the uh, heat spot where they used a, um, the dive, Fandango's dive to the outside to tweak his knee. Yeah. They worked that into the heat spot. I, I like the way that was done. And Santos going over clean with his finish, uh, putting over his finish. And you want to talk about an, another great sell job. Um, Drake Maverick sold that for so well. He sold it so well and so long. Even when the heels were leaving, he's still selling. And by direct contrast, on the other side of, of, of the Wednesday Night War, um, one of the Young Bucks took a double-team finish from the Lucha Brothers that looked like murder. It looked so good. And within seconds, he seemed he's already on his feet. And, of course, he's, like, holding his neck a little bit. But I'm like, damn, you could have – man, you should be in traction after that. You know? <laughs> it, um, but, yeah, it, it, was, it was another good outing. But, like I said, you know um, – and I forget the name of the six men all together, but Santos Escobar is a team. The Legado heel thing right now for those two guys is – what's that? Legado del Fantasma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those. Uh, God bless you. The heel, the, the heel work on there is going to have to uh, pick up a little bit. David Hill, yeah, he said yeah, I, I agree. Watching DJZ, who – we've been watching him for a long time, you know, since TNA Impact when he was one of the – the bromance, and then he was the DJ with the bromance and everything else. He is a he is a lucha wrestler. He loves to dive and flip and jump, and he's super talented. He's a good looking young guy. It's going to be hard for people to want to boom, so he's going to have to dig down deep to become way more dastardly. But uh, you know, Brizango was always that funny haha -ha team, and I think last night they showed that they I mean, they've always proven that that, that they can go. But I think last night um, they were the old guys in the match, and it was very competitive. I thought it was very good. I thought they were doing some great storytelling. And, again, it's something that you normally don't see uh, that often, especially on Wednesday nights where they're trying to progress a story and actually sell and, and, and get certain things over, and that's exactly what they did. That it was interesting, too, because they were physically bigger than Santos' henchmen. Yes. You know, normally you yes. think you got these two heaters, they're going to be the big guys like AOP. But like I said, they're the mini AOP back there. And Fandango's a big boy. You know, he's just he's one of those deceptively big guys. But it stood out last night how big he is. You know, the next match you guys did the be the booking for was the main event for the championship, the unification or the one winner takes all match. Before we get to that, there's another match I want to get your thoughts on because I found it to be an awesome wrestling contest. And that's the matchup between Johnny Gargano and Isaiah Scott. Um, I hadn't seen much from Isaiah Scott. I thought they told a great story. The match went almost 15 minutes. I thought they told a great story. I thought they had tremendous athleticism. And while there were a lot of high spots, if you will, in the matchup, 
they all seem to make some sense. And Dave, why do you have that ridiculous smirk on your <laughs> Because I know for a fact you do not remember seeing the swerve Isaiah Scott at our shenanigans party in New York City a year ago. I, I of course I don't. I was working. I was working. <laughs> You know, but no, I mean, I'll be honest. I was like, Johnny Gargano is coming out and having this match. And yeah, it was very good. Maybe they, they could have, you know, built it up a little bit more because it was just completely cold. Unless I missed something last week as to why that, you know, they were going to have that. But um, I well, think it went a little bit too long. It was a good I story, do. though, because later on we saw a pr promo, I believe, with Gargano and Candice both talking about how they were victorious on the same night. So maybe that's why we needed to get there. But Shane, what did you think of that matchup between those two stars? I mean, it was a good match. Like Dave said, it was uh, didn't seem like there was a lot of story to it. But uh, for a bell to bell, I mean, those this, this guys put on a hell of a match. A lot of good stuff. Um, the finish, you know, Gargano just going over clean for a heel. That doesn't do a lot for me, you know. But if it's what they wanted, sometimes that's just what they want. Uh, Shane Strickland. Uh, Isaiah Scott, he's been a, I mean, he's been talented for a while, so it's good to see him uh, get a chance to showcase his his skills. But also, there was another match too. I don't know if you guys uh, remember, but Bronson Reed, who last week yeah. I said could be a Vader guy, him and Tony Nese had a really good one too. And Bronson came out with a, a good win, and I really like that match as well. Shane, why do you think they don't use Tony Nese better? I mean, the guy checks all the boxes. He has the look. He's talented. He can go. He can, but th there's still something that I can't – he doesn't have a hook. You know, I, and when you don't have that hook, it's going to be hard to get mass appeal. You don't mm -hmm. get mass appeal without a hook. You just don't. And I really don't know what makes Tony different than – you know, there's a bunch of guys that can do those type of things that Tony does. And uh, I just say one day he's going to find himself, and he's going to click – and you're going to see the real Tony Nese and how far he can go because the potential is there for him to oh, be an even ridiculous. bigger, bigger star. But right now, it's just I don't, I don't know. I mean, he just seems like a guy that's doing a bunch of a bunch of things and trying to combine them all into one, and it doesn't stand out to me. And you know, I don't believe like when he's a heel, I don't believe it. Same thing with Gargano with that promo he cut with Candice after. I didn't believe a word of that shit. I mean, you know, if, if you don't cut believable promos, it's going to hurt you. Do you put like someone like a Tony Nese with Zelina Vega and let her her charisma, you know, rub off on him? Or maybe do you put Tony Nese with um, Seth Rollins and make him part of that group? Maybe, maybe so. You know, but you got to, I mean, still, you got to get on a hook. His damn gimmick is like the athlete or some shit. Mm hmm. That's like the worst – like MMA, there was a list of the worst nicknames of all time, and the athlete was the number one worst. <laughs> and so he's well, the premier athlete. I'm like, that, that – I'm never going to get behind that. I'm never going to wear a no. T-shirt that says the premier athlete, Tony Nese, on it. I'm just not. <laughs> but, yeah. like, I wanted him too, like, uh, because he would wear this thing at one time where he would uh, – the abs were cut out. Like, he was really yeah. proud of the abs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why don't you do something like – Remember how Rick Rude would wear the robes and it was a big deal to even see the abs. Like if that's your thing, do something like that. You know, if you're going to be arrogant, be really arrogant. Right. I just, uh, I don't know. Like I said, right now he's just missing a hook. And I mean, believe it or not, that that's the one thing that's held a lot of people down. You need a hook. And that's going to be my next t-shirt. Where's your hook? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a fishing t-shirt. <laughs> I got nervous when I saw Bronson Reed because I knew Tony Nese wasn't going to have much of a chance. Bronson Reed, I tell you, what's really cool right now for 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 me at least, when you have guys like Karrion Cross, Big Keith Lee, Bronson Reed, there's actually now legit heavyweights yeah. working their way back into everything pro wrestling, especially into the title pictures. And yeah. I think that's going to be a big game changer going forward for NXT and the main roster when you can have legit monsters like that on TV. And that finish looked incredible. And, dude, I don't, I don't want people to think I'm knocking on Tony because Tony is great and he can have a good match with anybody on the roster. And you always need people like that. But if he wants to get to that next level, if you want to get past the just having a good match guy, you got to have a hook. 
Well, this is the Pro Wrestling Report Prime Time. It's a super show on a Thursday night. We are live on Fight TV. We're also simulcasting live on our social media channels, that being YouTube, Facebook, and also Twitter and Twitch. So follow us, like us, subscribe, no get the notifications turned on, and check us out each and every Thursday night live. And we also come to you with another live edition Saturday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern, also on Fight TV. As we continue to talk about NXT, the Great American Bash from just last night on the USA Network from WWE, it was a winner-takes-all match as the NXT champion went up against the NXT North American champion. Adam Cole comes in, the NXT champion, with a some year-long reign as champion in NXT against the unstoppable Keith Lee. And it would be Keith Lee who was unstoppable last night and would defeat Adam Cole and would walk out taking all as the winner in that matchup. Now, full disclosure, we do know that the results of this match had been leaked on social media last week. However, that was post-show that we did. So your picks both for Keith Lee, your bookings were in line with what WWE ultimately did, but the match itself, the celebration, the hoopla at the end was great, but the match itself, the content, the 19 minutes and 55 seconds that the two of them went, what were your thoughts on that match? We'll start with you, David Hero. For a guy the size of Keith Lee to go 20 minutes with, 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 with a smaller guy, which is creating a lot of motion, a lot of big moves, super impressive. And what better way to end the Great American Bash night two than to have that match? Because – when you have some of the legends and, and, and the, the superstars of WWE saying Adam Cole always wins, you almost have doubt that, B, that big Keith Lee can't win that big match. And uh, just how it ended, yeah, of course, we, 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 we heard that Keith Lee was going to win last week. It didn't make a difference. I think people still wanted to watch. They didn't care if, you, you know, if they knew or not. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next, especially now with Adam Cole, because you got to wonder, does he get a rematch or does now he go off somewhere else? Because uh, they, they, they need Adam Cole on Raw, on SmackDown, and absolutely NXT. But congrats to Big Keith Lee. What a great match. And I'm surprised how quickly he has become the, the top guy in NXT. Now, was there a stipulation that the uh, Ultimate Era, I mean, Undisputed Era couldn't get involved? I don't remember. I that, don't was remember the, that, that was the surprise that uh, there was no, you know, because, I mean, you think Rick, Rick Flair defending against Nikita Koloff, you're going to have Tully trying to come in and help somehow. Aren't. So uh, that was the only thing that was odd. But other than that, um, man, I thought it was really good. Like you said, Keith, Keith Lee didn't look winded. And somebody that big that can move like that and his ass don't get tired too, yeah. that's scary. <laughs> That's scary. And, you know, Adam Cole, you know, and, you know, I don't want to talk about the size thing because that's always going to be mentioned in an Adam Cole match because he's always going to be the smaller guy. But, man, you kind of forget about it after a while. You know, his facials are great. He's got great timing, great ring presence. Uh, and his offense is, is believable. You know, he looks like he's trying to do shit. So um, the only thing that's kind of goofy was the Canadian Destroyer. You know, that's just being Nick Picky right now. Um, but. I thought they, re I thought they really delivered. I thought Adam yeah. Cole's facials were great. Keith Lee's facials were great, and even knowing the finish, I forgot about it. I forgot that I knew it, and I was like, "Oh, you know, kind of like kicking out on two on a couple of those." So uh, I thought it was really well done. Like I said, the only thing that was just odd was the non-involvement of the undisputed era. But now that Adam Cole's lost, it might be time to. Um, disband that undisputed era if you want nxt to keep going i mean you got four guys that could go against each other and tear it up every single night you got them locked down in one group right now and you know, in, a, in a period of time where we're kind of you know the roster's thin this might not be the time to have the undisputed era as a group it might be time to let them go to separate ways and let's get roderick strong against uh adam cole and matches like that because they'll kill it every night well, and, you know, maybe the reason why the Undisputed Era wasn't involved was because then it was a definitive victory by Keith Lee. There wasn't any outside shenanigans that may have or could have cost Adam Cole the match. So now that chapter is closed, and then those four can now go off and do something completely different, and then Keith Lee goes on to his next contender. Now, I like that. I like what you said, but I need to explain to me because as somebody who's watching – 
Undisputed Era get involved in each other's matches all the time and helping. And now in one of the biggest matches of the group's existence, where, mm-hmm. where are these guys at? Yeah, and, I'm surprised William Regal didn't pop up on an iPad somewhere and, and go over all the stipulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Shane, you mentioned the Canadian Destroyer. Uh, who did it better is a question that we can ask AEW or NXT. Oh, AEW. That shit blew me away. That was insane. <laughs> Was that good. was that dangerous. Was... That was dangerous yeah. last night. Yeah. Because they actually overshot each other. It was dangerous. It was... it was beautiful. That was NXT's Great American Bash night two. When you take the two nights combined, gentlemen, when you look at the event that was presented, substantial things happening on the NXT side, as stated, Keith Lee walking out with the championships. Uh, some special moments, I think, across the shows. But how would you rank the overall two-week effort of NXT's Great American Bash, Dave? Are we giving a letter grade? I'll give it an A because both nights they had matches that had senses of urgency where people were legitimately fighting either for their careers, for uh, championships, or they were fighting for something. So you always felt that they were legitimately trying to win their match. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Dave. Uh, I thought, man, the storytelling – and you got more emotion, uh, I felt, out of the Great American Bash matches. And uh, another real quick tidbit on last night, and I don't know if they've done it before and I just didn't pay attention, but when Johnny Gargano has that little thing always been on the ceiling when he does his entrance where it says, uh, all heart, no soul, from the ca- I don't know if they've done it before or not. It was, if it was the first time I saw it. But the camera the, – right? the ca- yeah. The camera shot on that from a production standpoint, that was pretty damn cool. I like that. But, uh, yeah, I thought the Great American Bash was good, and uh, apparently it was a good idea to uh, attach the Great American Bash label to those to these past two weeks. It worked out well. Hey, the WWE, they find a way. And you know what it is also? I mean, it, it, if, you, if you look at it, look at the moments that the fans have not been a part of. You know, we, we can talk about Drew McIntyre beating Brock Lesnar Undertaker's last match, uh, the money in the bank, uh, and now Big Keith Lee. Without the fans there, Big Keith Lee winning both belts on just a regular NXT is eh. But now he can say he won it at the Great American Bash, and now it means 10 times more because of the history of that show. Yes. Yeah, and that's the one thing about the Universus Fighter Fest. We didn't have that big thing, which – I still stand by it should have been the best friends getting those tag team championships. We didn't get that. And we got it from the great American bash. I want to have that one memory from a, a pay-per-view or a pay-per-view type event where I go, Hey, remember when that happened? Cause like they said, if it just happened on July the 7th or whatever, yesterday, whatever yesterday's date was, if it just happens on that day, I ain't going to remember that shit, but I remember that it happened at the great American bash. That's a good point. And you talk about, obviously, it being uh, beneficial for WWE. Well, WWE did achieve its second straight week ratings win in the Wednesday Night Wars, if you want to call them that. However, it is important to note both shows were down in viewers. And was, it second, was it second week or third? I think it might be the third week in a row. It uh, could be. I'm just looking at the, the, the back-to-back special events, if you will. Ah, I got you. Got but. You. WWE bringing in 759,000 viewers, down about about 4% from last week. NXT down about 4% for last week as well, bringing in 415,000 viewers. So the win, of course, goes to NXT, but the win goes to all the wrestling fans. 1.4 plus million people watching on a Wednesday night, both shows. And what I think is very interesting that I'm surprised I haven't seen enough coverage on is what may matter more in the Wednesday night wars of today versus the Monday night wars of past is – the DVR plus seven ratings, because since the shows are back to back, head to head, rather, a lot of people are watching a show later. The overnights don't include any DVR watching. So the numbers might adjust up or down. And maybe we'll have to depend on Chris Jericho to share that information with us, as he did on Twitter last week, pointing out that AEW did better in the also important 18 to 49 demographic scoring more viewers in that category than the other. So, Dave, what, what do you think about the ratings results of the two shows? You know what? I'm not surprised NXT won. I think because there was so much buzz about Keith Lee, people still love watching history. They still like seeing title changes, and they want to see new champions crowned. And they knew, hey, I'm going to tune in because I want to see su- – wrestling fans love their wrestling history. Um, but 
when you, and then when you have Orange Cassidy going up against Chris Jericho with really nothing at stake, or do you want to watch a chance to see somebody get both NXT titles? I think it's a pretty easy decision. And Damien, the other thing also, um, TNT has their own app that you can download and watch their shows as well. So who knows how many views are going to get off of that. But, you know, like, like you said, 1.4 million people watched wrestling on Wednesday night as opposed to one, almost 1.7 watched it on Monday. That, that's a pretty telling story about how popular wrestling is on Wednesday nights. And I don't know how well it, how well it goes, too, because like, if you are flipping channels, do you, do you give credit to both shows? Like, I, I, like I, this, the whole rating thing is just kind of kabuki, and yeah. it's one of those things that's kind of you can't hang your hat on that too much. If as close as this thing was, there really isn't no tell, no telling. I mean, if if for some reason AEW had had a four point oh and uh, NXT had a one point oh, okay, we can give them a win. This close, both shows won. So like, and I know a lot of people that they'll watch one and then DVR the other. They're watching both shows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 you know. I never really hang my head. That's for the business guys. I'm, I'm on the I'm on the artist side of the business. So, uh, <laughs> ratings, yes, they're important, but half that shit don't make no sense to me. I had um, I had a Nielsen person call my house one time, ask me to do the to, to put in the box. In all my years, that's only happened once, and it was like three years ago. Or no, 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 it was just last year because I was working with WWE, and she asked me. Uh, they asked me, did I work with the entertainment? I go, yes, I work on a television show. And that disqualified me from having the Nielsen box. Yeah. But that's well, the only time in my whole life I've ever had anybody even – that I, I never even knew anybody that had one. If you had the box while you were a WWE employee, how would your viewing habits have changed? I wouldn't be home. I'd be working on the show. Correct, but, <laughs> but, but, but your viewing habits would probably have been modified, right? Well, I guess so. You know, you, you know, think you, his you wife wants to watch it. wrestling? She's put up with it forever. It's the last thing she wants to watch. Oh, I had to buy another TV for the office here. I didn't got kicked out of the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, speaking of business, before we get to AEW and Fighter Fest, and I think to be fair, as we talk about the ratings uh, comparison between the two shows, Fighter Fest was to have had Moxley versus Cage. That, of course, pushed to fight for the Fallen next week. So we got to give them the, 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 the consideration for that, I guess you could say. But speaking of considerations, promotional consideration is indeed paid for by the following, David. Yes, it is. CollaredElbowBrand.com is where you can go to get all of your Collar and Elbow brand themed wrestling t-shirts. The new summer line has dropped. It's absolutely tremendous. There's some tank tops, bright new colors. Of course, there's the Shane Helms T-shirts, Stand Back, uh, as well as uh, the the T-shirt for our good friend Shad. Uh, So head over there. Use promo code PWR360 at the CollarAndElbowBrand.com and save some money and support Elbow Brand and the Pro Wrestling Report. And Shane, you got a great Collar and Elbow shirt there on as well. Every week, man. I've been a Collar and Elbow Brand sponsored athlete since the beginning. So uh, they've been a partner in just about everything I do. So... uh, Yeah, go ahead and check them out. You know, what's interesting is each week, you know, you guys with your different collar and elbow shirts, and they are always different. So the quality, the line rather, uh, quantity of shirts available at collarandelbowbrand.com, absolutely amazing. And Dave, as you said, the summer line just dropping now, which is great as well. Yeah, it's it's fantastic, and you will love them. Damien, if we knew what your address was, I'm sure you would have got some. I'm in the Federal Witness Protection Program, so my address is unknown <laughs> and undisclosed. But what is known and has been disclosed is, Shane, you have uh, taken this show from Fight TV and the airwaves to also the audio waves and the Pro Wrestling Report primetime super show with the superstar Hurricane Helms is also available in podcast form along with the Highway to Helms podcast. Shane, tell us about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Prime Time with Hurricane Helms is how I, I guess it's called. I don't That's know. the name of the show, bro. So, sometimes you call it Super Show. I don't know what the hell's going on, but I just follow your lead. Uh, but, yeah, look look for Prime Time with Hurricane Helms on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever the best podcast may be. That's where you'll find me and my fellow hosts, uh, Damian Nelson and uh, Dave Hero, Prime Time with Hurricane Helms. And, of course, Highway to Helms is there every week. Uh, actually, it's more every uh, about every week and a half now because I get lazy. 
<laughs> well, you got a lot going on. You're doing this show. You're doing podcasts. You're doing Strangely enough, I do. I'm the only guy that can get fired and get busy. <laughs> Wait, I thought you got kicked out of the bedroom. Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on now and talk about AEW Fighter Fest was the name of the event. It was from Jacksonville, Florida. They, too, brought us about 69 minutes of wrestling to a uh, NXT 67 minutes of wrestling. Interesting that it's sort of uh, tit for tat there, I guess, uh, neck and neck rather. Uh, six matches total, five of which we talked about on Be the Booker last week. Let's go down the line and talk about them as they happen. The opening contest was for the tag team championship. It was Kenny Omega and Adam Page defending against Private Party. Private Party, a party accompanied to the ring by Matt Hardy. That was not enough, though. P uh, Page and um, and uh, Omega, sorry, I got distracted there. Page and Omega win the match and retain the straps, the titles in that contest. Shane, what did you think of the match by which you both, you and Dave, pick Omega and Page to retain? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. It was, uh, you know, once it got rocking and rolling, um, you see a lot of good offense from both teams. You got two teams that are baby faces, so uh, you're not really going to get this heel you know, this or this desperate baby face trying to make a comeback. You're not going to get that. You're going to get two uh, teams showing their offense, um, popping the crowd, and, and that's what he did. You know, uh, some good stuff at the end. Uh, private party's got a lot of room to grow, though, so they're going to be fine with uh, Matt Hardy there coaching them. Uh, and, I mean, overall, I thought it was a pretty good match. You know, it's interesting when you say private party has plenty of room to grow and Matt Hardy there watching them. Uh, I wouldn't say it was any greenness, but the difference in the ability of each team was clearly evident, I thought, last night. Private Party was not bad. There were no botches. There were no misses. But they were focused on telling us how young they were. And in telling us how young they were, the commentary team, that got me thinking about how much experience they don't have. Right. So it sort of made it more vivid. But, again, I don't think it showed, and maybe if I wasn't being told, again, 21 and 23, 22, 23, whatever their ages are, that I would not have uh, been as, as – as, I wouldn't have noticed as much. But what I did notice was what I believe it was Mark Keen, Mark Keen was wearing. That was one heck of a wrestling outfit, huh? JR said his bedroom carpet looks exactly like it. Yeah, I mean, to keep in mind, though, those guys who you're comparing them to, Kenny Omega is one of the best pound-for-pound -pound wrestlers in the world right now. You know, and has been for many, many years. Adam Page is going to be an AEW champion. And I, I think Kenny Omega will, too. So to, for the private party to be in there with those guys and kind of, you know, hold their own, uh, I think that was – I think they did really well. Are, is, are, are they going to be as fluid? Are they going to be as seasoned as uh, Page and Omega? No, but not many people are going to be. Right. David Hero, what did you think of that tag team championship matchup? I thought that – it was probably the best match Private Party has had that I've seen in quite a while. Um, again, though, it just seemed really overproduced, over choreographed at times. So for me, if I'm flipping back and forth from channel to channel and I'm seeing two women beat the holy hell out of each other, and then I see just a bunch of flippy stuff with Private Party, well, guess what channel I wound up watching a little bit more of last night in the opening 15, 20 minutes of that show? And you're going to so, see that, though. You're going to see that in a babyface versus babyface match. Those become just spot fests. Right. They but, always do. When you got a heel out there, like if I'm out there with a heel, like, and this is just my experience talking, like, hey, man, just do whatever you're going to do you're doing your heat. I'll sell a call. You don't got to tell me that shit. I'll figure it out. You know, but when you have baby faces like that, especially when their styles are flip, flop, fly, you can't call that shit on the fly. And that's, no, you know, it's just kind of how it is. And I understand that, but the, the, the part that was frustrating for me was that at times it just seemed like they were very tentative as to what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Like they were overthinking before it happened, and that was my disconnect. So, but uh, I mean, oh, I mean, I because mean they, they were. were. They were yeah, they were. Yeah, I mean, you, they were. They, they were. They were uh, yeah. You picked up on it, yeah. You're you correct. know what I'll say in that matchup? I, I actually noticed, and, and I think it was this match. It could have been the eight men as well. I told myself, because I too was flipping back and forth between the street fight and this match, and that was so well done, so well paced, so choreographed in a great way. Choreographed such that we didn't notice it was choreographed, which is the perfect choreography. But I was when I flipped back to AEW, I'm like, stop waiting. Mm -hmm. Stop waiting for the move. Stop waiting in the right spot. Stop waiting yeah. for the for the for the for the for the for your opponent to come after you. 
And that became very evident to me flipping back and forth between the two shows during these matches last night. And, and, and two, there were spots where you, it's weird because they're, they're, sometimes they're waiting, which is bad. And then sometimes they're just they're doing so many moves, you can't even remember what you just saw. Yeah. You know, so that Speak- but that's one of those styles that's kind of, you know, <laughs> just came along. So. Speaking of with Shane, tell us about, you know, you, you put out a tweet yesterday about your 2020 so far. And it was, a match with the Undertaker. it was a match where the Undertaker just whooped your ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of moves. And I forgot what, you know, January was by the time I got to May, <laughs> the way you presented it. But how does it work there but not work here? Uh, because we, one of those moves, what you can say in a move is a turnbuckle smash. Yes. Then a punch. Then a, a, a buckle whip. It's not a power bomb, a Canadian destroyer, a DDT, and seven exactly. super Exactly. It was all pacing was the and up? selling, and one and one flowed into the other. Yeah, was that, it? that that was what was beautiful about that, and just the selling. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That's selling, woo! Man, that Gregory Helms can sell his ass off. That hurricane guy, not so much. <laughs> it's good because Gregory Helms can't sell no merch. <laughs> he can sell in the ring, but he couldn't sell no merch. But uh, until until the Gregory Helms shirt come out, which I will have one next week, I'm gonna have to wear that one on the show because this is my number one seller on pro wrestling tees right now. It's an ugly ass Gregory Helms shirt. I can't believe it. <laughs> Hey, was that turnbuckle supposed to come off? In that- no, no. I just <laughs> it on my face. Like normally, when Taker does that, he throws the guy, and the guys always take that bump with their back. But I wanted to take it face forward and pop up, and just just to be different. And then uh, it just came off. I don't know what yeah, happened. You were different, all right. <laughs> and so, the best thing about that whole match is I end up taking the highest choke slam. I mean, Taker told me that he goes, "I think that's the highest choke slam I ever did." Boom. And then I take a tombstone, which looks like murder. Um, now he's pinning me. So here comes your boy, Ken Anderson. You have to go back and watch <laughs> this now. At, so it's one, two, three. And at the three, he's going to come in and blast Undertaker in the back. Ken knees me right in the fucking head. Oh, but shoot. <laughs> 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 so the word, so I didn't got, I didn't take all of this damage from the Undertaker. I get the big chokes land, the tombstone. I'm just laying there. Okay, my night's over. Here comes Ken's knee right in my damn head. And no, and you can't even really see it. You can just see me go, ah! <laughs> Go tip me, please. Mm-hmm. Well, with that, let's uh, move on and talk about AEW's Fighter Fest. We'll continue to talk about AEW's Fighter Fest. The next matchup that we saw was a singles match for about 11 minutes. It was Lance Archer going up against Joey Janela. Now, with Lance Archer, with Jake Roberts, with Joey Janela was Sonny Kiss. And uh, David Hero, you picked Janela to win that matchup, and Shane Helms, you was picked, I drinking? You picked, was I drinking last week? You must have been, but uh, jeez, ha! Well, it didn't get booked the way you would have booked it. So how do you feel about the way it was booked? Well, I guessed first of all. Um, I, I just don't understand why they would invest all that time and stuff with Janela and Sunny Kiss to have them both just being destroyed, unless it was just a big one-off for two straight weeks to make Lance Archer that much more of a dastardly vicious heel. But I mean, I thought Lance art Lance Archer checks a lot of the boxes. The one thing I wasn't a very big fan of was early on the match where he's destroying Joey Janela. And it was the, it was the right off the bat when they both wind up outside the ring and Janela hits Lance Archer with one punch and it rocked him for like two minutes. And I was like, how did that just happen? But other than that, I thought it was pretty vicious. I thought that uh, Jake, who Jake may have lost a step or three. I don't know. But, um, you know, good for Lance Archer that he keeps rolling on. And he's going to wind himself back up in that title picture for one of the two titles pretty soon at the rate he's going. Shane, what you think? Yeah, I thought it was a good match. You know, uh, Joy, uh, Joy has his shortcomings, but man, the, the, he still has a lot of charisma. You know, and charisma is something you can't package, you can't teach it, and you can't buy it. So uh, he he ha- he does have that. Um, and the story with him and Sonny Cash, just because they just started doing promos, I don't feel like it's over. You know, I mean, I think you can keep everything going and let them grow. You can be Billy Kidman. Remember, Kidman went from a jobber to a member of the flock. 
And it took forever, you know, to ever for him to get there. But when he did, man, he was one of WCW's uh, uh, best best talents. You know, they still, there's still a lot of room to grow there. Still a lot of room to grow. I love Lance Archer is better. I mean, he's been around for like 20 years. It seems. Yeah. And now it, it seems like it's finally all together. And it's really weird. I'm not sure he needs Jake, Jake Roberts. I'm not sure he needs him. Uh, yeah. And the whole thing with Jake distracting the referee last night, like that kind of like, oh, that, that was my least favorite part of the match. And I, it wasn't I feel needed. weird. I, I feel weird saying anything about Jake's, Jake Roberts wouldn't be needed. You know what I'm saying? But I, I don't know. Uh, that just seems off. I don't know if Lance needs him. Lance looked like a killer last night. And man, that, that's what, that's what the business is missing. It's missing those, those big men, those monsters, you know, um, I thought he looked great. All right. Well, that matchup uh, was followed by the eight-man tag team match, and this one had a lot of people participating. Woo! Please listen carefully. I know I'm <laughs> with match results, but you're bad with names. So this is <laughs> Butcher and the Blade, the Butcher and the Blade, teaming up with the Lucha Brothers, Pentagon Jr. and uh, Ray Phoenix, going up against FTR, of course, Cash Wheeler, Dax Harwood, and the Young Bucks, this eight-man tag team match, saw the Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha Brothers actually win. And what we could have expected and probably expected, and I think you both have talked about on this program, that that, that dissension, if you will, very minimal, but a little bit of dissension between the Bucks and FTR was shown in this match as well. Shane, what did you think of this eight-man tag team effort? I liked it. I mean, I thought it was there was you know more spots than you can shake a stick at. You know, it was a, I don't know if I used this analogy before, but it was like a Robin Williams concert. If you ever seen Robin Williams, he tells 8 million jokes and you can't remember one of them. Because he's going 193 miles. Yeah, yeah. And, and it worked for him. Yeah. It worked for him. So that style does work for some people. Uh, there was a lot going on. Uh, you can see, man, FTR, man, they know what they're doing. They know who they are. The Young Bucks know what they're doing. They know who they are. It, you know, the Blade and the Butcher were the youngest team in there, but they didn't look out of place, man. They look good. The Lucha Brothers do some insane shit, and Ray Phoenix is as good as a high flyer as there's ever been, ever in the history of the business. He, he is that good. Um, I think toward the end, you know, with the Lucha Brothers, uh, some of that Lucha psychology came into play, which means that it doesn't exist. You know, once things start breaking down, that's when you don't try to be funny anymore. That's when you don't do the ha ha spots. Once we start to get to a point where we didn't got past the heat, now we need to come back. Now we're really kicking each other's ass. There's a couple of times where they kind of slowed it down to put some weird ha ha spot in there that just really kind of didn't fit the flow. But other than that, if you want to talk about athleticism, you won't never see anything better than that. You won't, you know, the uh, the Canadian destroyer that we spoke about earlier, that spot was insane. It was insane. Uh, it was amazing. It was also it was also cringeworthy because and they shot it perfectly because you sort of saw the setup in the ring to the rope and then all of a sudden everybody out there and it happened fluidly and I didn't really actually realize it was Canadian Destroyer first until the replay where I'm like oh whoa wait a minute that just got that much better it looked good but now that I know what it was it was even better. Yeah, then they had that uh, superplex powerplex. Uh, owed to the power and glory, which they modified. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of good athletic shit, you know. Um, and then, you know, we, I think, you know, I don't know who picked who on this one. I know I, I thought that this would be a good match to kind of start the dissension with, you know, let's go ahead and get FTR and the Young Bucks at each other. And uh, I don't know that a big seed was planted, but they didn't win, so they got something to talk about. I think both of you, actually, I know both of you did pick the Lucha Brothers and uh, and uh, okay. uh, the Butcher and the Blade in this match. And I think you did so because of that plan for dissension that we would see between the two teams, FTR and the Young Bucks. And I do want to say the Lucha Brothers finish looked like murder. I know I talked about that a little bit earlier. That finish looks like it could kill anybody and needs to be sold accordingly. You know, EW has the opportunity or the challenge, you could say, of always being a bit too over the top giving too much in the matches, too many spots, too much in one match. Um, this was that match, but this was one of the most perfectly executed matchups because as you said, Shane, there was so much happening. It was so well paced. And when the finisher happened, I actually felt 
that it was the finisher, not because they knew it was, or obviously it was the finisher, but it felt right at the time it was hit. And that, I think, is a signature that they don't always have, that they did have in this match, which was great. I agree. David Hero, your thoughts on, on the Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha You know Bro what? I match. thought this match was nothing short of doing great business. It elevated Butcher and Blade to now become a legit tag team contender. Because now, you know, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with two of the best tag teams in wrestling, and they won with one of the best tag teams in wrestling. I thought it was great. I thought that not only did they elevate Butcher and Blade, they brought back the Lucha Brothers back, who've been off TV for a little while. And then it did. It, it planted the, the seed. Eventually, we're going to get to uh, the Young Bucks against FTR. Uh, but, you know, going back to that Canadian um, – the story that we talked about, Shane, they must have been listening to you last week because when they, when the cameraman was there, he caught it just right. It was absolutely perfect. It didn't show anybody waiting. You just saw the bodies crashing. Well done. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Butcher and Blade get re-energized uh, re and now do some other great things. And then you watch the other tag teams go off and start to uh, make some more money. Yeah, all four teams came out looking good. And, man, sometimes sometimes that doesn't happen. No, not at all. And, and if any if any one of those four teams was going to look bad, it would have been Butcher and the Blade, and they and they came out actually much stronger than I thought they would have. There was one moment, I'm not going to nitpick, there was one moment there for Butcher or Blade, I don't remember which one, the one with all the tattoos. Um, there, was a, there was an awkward cover, pull up, he wasn't a legal man uh, situation. I'm not going to nitpick at it, though, but – Here's what I will ask is, I'm not sure I realized until they were in this element in this match just how good uh, FTR is, how good they are. And there was talk of Tully Blanchard and Ron Anderson by the commentary team in this matchup. They're not far off. I mean, they're certainly not to that level of greatness because just they haven't been in the business as long. But the old school presentation, the – manly look that they have it's something we haven't seen in a very long time unless i'm missing something in the wrestling business and i'm refreshed by it yeah and one yeah. of them was put on some muscle not the, not the uh i yeah, the, they got the new names which i can't really remember not the ballroom but with the one with the hair he's been putting Gosh. some time in the gym yeah yeah, yeah he looks yeah. jacked you yeah. Know? yeah so uh, and i love the uh that people compare him to on and tully because they do too but they're both really just two Arns because Tully was a heel. Arn was a tweener. Tully yeah. was the heel. You know, so uh, – and that, that's, yeah. a, that's not a bad thing at all. I was having Cal watch some old um, Great American Bash WCW pay-per-views from the 80s. And when Tully and Arn came out, Cal immediately is like, wow, he goes, that looks ju just like FTR, the way they walk, the way they carry themselves – they look like grown men going in to just break some skulls. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued, and I'm looking forward to seeing when things finally do fall apart between them and the Young Bucks, because I've said a few times on this program, I appreciate and really, really respect the Young Bucks for what they are, but those smirks turn me off. They're always smirking, and it's just its so <laughs> snarky, and it just, ah, it just irritates because me. Because they got paid. Because they make a lot of money. And everyone oh. said they wouldn't be anything. Now are they're they telling everybody Twitter? that we did it. Are, are they still off Twitter? I have no idea. I think they came back. Hmm. Everybody, everybody comes, comes back. back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we go from a man tag to a six-man tag. And the next match we're going to talk about was the Dark Order, Brody Lee and Stu Grayson teaming up to take on Coke. I'm sorry, teaming up with Coke Cabana. Uh, how about Bruce? series of bruises he's got uh, that they showed us prior to the matchup. Going up against SoCal Uncensored SCU, of course, Scorpio Sky, Frankie Kazarian, and Christopher Daniels. It would be Colt Cabana and the Dark Order winning this matchup. Goes about 11 and a half minutes, and you both, I believe, picked SCU, actually, to win this matchup, or you would have booked it that way. It didn't go that way, so we'll start with you, Dave. How did you feel about the match, and why did they go in a different direction than what you would have booked? It's because they didn't know what was good for business. That's why they went that <laughs> way. I mean, I mean, I get it, but uh, see, here's where it doesn't make sense to me. Earlier on, you you know, I, I talked about Joy Janela and Sonny Kiss being put together, trying to get some chemistry going between them. 
and then they don't win. But then you have Colt Cabana, who f- looks like a square peg in a round hole with a dark order, but they then go on and beat SCU. Completely confused by that. I un- I guess I understand because you want to have Cabana with Brody Lee. I don't. I just don't see the value in that together unless they do a complete transformation on Colt Cabana because he can't be boom boom. I mean, unless they change into like Doom Doom or something like that. But you know, Colt Cabana is just—he's the proverbial baby face. He's the one everybody loves, and you know, I, I just have a hard time seeing him meshing well with the Dark Order. Yeah, yeah. I, there's not a lot there to disagree with. You know, I, I get it. The uh, Dark Order has the storyline, but especially uh, coming off the match that SCU had the week before, where they really just reinforced how good they how good they were and gave a reminder to uh, mm-hmm. our short term memory uh, short term memory audience that sometimes exists. You know, uh, that's why I would have went with SCU. And I think there's still time to get to that dark order storyline. This, this is one of those cases where I wish that the roster was just a little bit more deeper. If the dark order needs a win, I get that. I just wish it didn't have to be against SCU. Do you think the dark order is this generation's dungeon of doom? <laughs> Come on, don't do that. Don't do that to him. <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, unless I can get Coca Cabana in an electric chair. <laughs> like, if that could happen, I'm in board. It just I, I just don't know where they're going with it because they don't have any have any enemies. They have no one that they're even targeting or feuding with. Yeah. It's just I, they that, exist. Yeah, they do just exist. <laughs> as far as cults go, they don't really have a mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they gotta work on. We gotta work on we gotta work on their Kool-Aid because Nobody's <laughs> drinking it. Nobody even knows where, where to get it from. <laughs> or if it's red or grape. Red or purple. Great. You are, you are so white. <laughs> oh, no. You want to challenge this? It's red or grape. It's, it's not- red or purple. We'll go, or- to tw- go to Twitter right now and ask people about their Kool-Aid. Is it grape or purple? <laughs> <laughs> it's red or pr- grape. Oh, wait, if it's grape or purple, is it both? I don't know now. Now I'm confused. <laughs> what are we doing here? Ask anybody. We even had this. We even had this conversation backstage in WWE because either Kofi or Big E came up to me and said, "What kind of uh, Kool Aid do you drink?" And I said, "Red or purple?" And they go, "Yeah, yeah, he gets it." <laughs> Great. Great. Nope. <laughs> well, Damien, I mean, come on. I mean, Big E is from Florida. Maybe it's called purple in Florida. Maybe I it's grape up in-, in the south. You know, from North Carolina southward, there's there must be some different terminology. Keep in mind, though, hey, Shane, what do you call soda in North Carolina? Drink. Drink. Everything's to drink, yeah. So you don't call it like I don't, I don't. I never called it pop. I heard some people call it soda pop, but I never called it. It was always you want to drink. If you I want to drink, generally meant soda. In the north, it's soda. In the middle of the country, going north to south or vertical, it's uh, it's pop. And then in the south, it's coke. Everything's Coke. Everything's Coke, yeah. Yeah. Man, yeah, Pepsi, Pepsi, was, Pepsi was made in North Carolina, so I'm going to have to throw a flag on that one. When I lived in New Orleans, I, when I first got down, Orleans. they're like, uh, hey, what kind of soda do you want? I'm like, uh, I'll have a – no, they said, what kind of Coke do you want? And I'm like, Coke. They were asking you something different. <laughs> <laughs> you misinterpreted that whole shit, man. I thought it was an expensive can of soda. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The final match that we're going to talk about, folks, from AEW Fighter Fest just last night on the TNT Network was the matchup between Chris Jericho and Orange Cassidy. Uh, of course, Jericho with Santana and Ortiz and Orange Cassidy with the best friends. Chris Jericho would get the best of Orange Cassidy in this matchup and win. Yep, this match, though, went some 18 minutes and uh, showed us, um, well, it was a good match, but... What I've wondered about for a while with Orange Cassidy is how much depth does he need beyond the depth that, that he has to be in these marquee star matchups because his shtick is his shtick and it works great. But I think the longer the matches go, you lose some of that, some of that shtick, if you will. Dave, we'll get your thoughts first on this matchup. Chris Jericho defeats Orange Cassidy 
And uh, both of you, by the way, had picked Jericho to win this match. So uh, congrats. Much like I was amazed that Keith Lee could go almost 20 minutes with his size. I can't believe that a guy that wrestles with his hands in his pockets went almost 20 minutes also. <laughs> and uh, it just shows how talented Orange Cassidy is. Yeah. And hey, Chris Jericho made Orange Cassidy last night. He did. He, if, if he's not a household name in, 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 in wrestling fans' households, there's something wrong. <laughs> but I mean, uh, Orange Cassidy went toe to toe with, you know, one of the absolute top five all time. I mean, he, he did an amazing job. I mean, Chris Jericho, there's nobody better in wrestling than him right now. And I, you can't even say that Jericho carried him. I mean, they did so much stuff together. Um, it, it was amazing. It was really well done. The only thing I wasn't a big fan of was when he hit him in the head with a bat and couldn't beat him. That I didn't get. But um, overall, I, I thought those two had a great match. And if they weren't going up against um, Big Keith Lee to Adam Cole – there's a really good chance that AEW would have won last night. Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I want to take my hat off. I'm not going to, but I would, you know, I would <laughs> take my uh, symbolic hat off to Orange Cassidy. People don't understand the pressure of a situation like that. You know, uh, somebody who's been in matches with like super top guys with the top of top guys, all the pressure was on Orange Cassidy. If that match would have sucked, Chris Jericho still would have been Chris Jericho. You know, if that match would have sucked, Orange Cassidy might not get another opportunity. All mm -hmm. the pressure is on Orange Cassidy right there. I know uh, Chris puts pressure on himself. That's why he's one of the best that's ever done this. Um, so, man, I, I thought it was great. It, to me, it was reminiscent of The Undertaker and Jeff Hardy. Was what? Really? That's, what that's what I would compare it to. That match on um, Raw you're talking about that they had where yep. after mm -hmm. Undertaker shook yep. Jeff's hand and made Jeff. Yeah, it was a coming out party for Jeff, and last night was a coming out party for Orange Cassidy. It shows us what exactly this guy can do. Now, how, where does it go uh, from here is, is going to be interesting because when you see what he can do, you got to be careful. Does he go back to the stick? I ran into that problem. There was a, you know, I had a moment in my career where Ric Flair came to me and he goes, you're too good for this gimmick, meaning that my work had outshined the gimmick. And it was shortly uh, within a year or so is when Gregory Helms came about mainly because of that conversation with Ric Flair. Um, so it's going to be interesting, but uh, I love this match. You know, I, I, I might even go back and watch it again. That's how good I thought this match was. You know, uh, Chris Jericho is just clicking on all cylinders. I can't believe this guy's how – I don't know exactly how old he is. He's a little bit older than me, and he just, man, he's bumping, putting in 18 minutes, looking great. You know, like I said, he, he went over – Orange Cassidy got over. We talked about that before. That's the perfect scenario. And I don't have anything bad to say about that. You know, you got the uh, the best friends out getting involved. Uh, Santana and Ortiz came out. Uh, did I say that right? Santana and Ortiz. They came out and got involved. So uh, you showed continuity with those groups, which is something that I didn't like about the uh, Keekly Adam Cole match, the continuity where Undisputed Era just was non-existent. You know, um. I, I love this match, and I thought it was a good cap off uh, to end the show last night. You know, that's interesting. Orange Cassidy being made in that match, as you say, with an interesting comparison that, that I don't disagree with. Um, I think a lot of people forget, though, Orange Cassidy has been wrestling for about 20 years, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's been 20. I don't know if it's that long. Maybe 10. I don't know about 20. Even so, I, I don't think people realize, as you said, Shane, you had wrestled him before, right? And you didn't quite realize it. We were either on the same team. I know he was in the match. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the match. He was either on my team or on the other team, but he was under a hood. So I can't give away his information. I can't give away what's going on there. Uh, yeah. But I, I had, think he was one of the I, red ants, right, in the trios. He was the red ant or the fire ant or whatever it was. He was, Yeah, some, something like that. Some, yeah. some, he was one of them. So he, I think he was in the match. I'm almost positive. I'm pretty sure he was in the locker room. <laughs> I think he was in town and like, I can't remember what he was going on. Are you but, aware uh, that we, we just received a little while ago a, uh, a a hurricane warning? I'm not being funny here. Like I'm I'm on the East Coast now, so these things matter. And it's down by you coming up uh coming up the Jersey Shore, it looks like by Friday. Down by who? <laughs> well, not me, because I'm not down anywhere. I don't live in Jersey. What the hell are you talking about down by? <laughs> it's south of Jersey, where I think North Carolina is. So North Carolina. If they if they make it 
this far inland is really bad. Normally they just they mess up the coast, but you know, I don't know. So you know what? But David, I get David, I get blamed for everything. <laughs> Blame it on the Shane. Oh, yeah. Wait, who's singing that? I can't do. It. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we didn't talk about the big announcement, though. It's a great oh, point. Oh, the uh, FTW? Yes. This was billed, and Dave, you talked about it. It was billed as a major game-changing announcement by Tony Khan, the uh, owner of AEW. Can't... When did Dixie Carter work for start oh, to work for AEW? You were doing so good. You were doing so good. You were doing so good. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's Seriously. A dagger. That's a dagger, bro. But, okay, but am I wrong? Let me someone tell me I'm wrong. Frame it. So uh, Taz, who's manager of Brian Cage, who, remember, was supposed to be going against Moxley, so they had to do something. And now that match will happen next week at Fight for the Fallen, which is not a Transformers movie. Um, they are – they had to do something. So Taz comes out, and he introduces, you know, the baddest belt ever that was never recognized by an actual wrestling company. It's the FTW. We know what that means, not to be confused with FTR or FDR. Uh, but the FTW championship introduced and graced upon Brian Cage, who is now going into his matchup against the AEW world champion as the FTW champion. I don't know if that one will be winner takes all, but that's what happened. What ha happened. So David Hero, please hate on it. It was terrible. That's not, that's <laughs> not, it was just bad. It's bad business because it means absolutely, it means a lot to Taz. Absolutely. Because Taz had that belt at a time when it meant everything. But to just dust it off and say, here you go, Brian Cage, here's a championship for you. If Brian Cage doesn't win next week, then it's a complete and utter disaster of a failure. I but mean, is he protected by not winning? Because he has a title. So No, if, not at all. Because, because now you're saying he's the biggest, baddest man on the planet. He is now the FTW world champion. And then in his first match since getting that title, if he loses – you have then now completely taken all the steam out of Brian Cage. Either Brian Cage wins next week, or it has to be a double disqualification of some sort. I mean, there's no way Brian Cage can be uh, uh, pin or submit in you know next Wednesday. But again, it happens too often in wrestling where there's this huge announcement that's going to change the landscape of everything. They couldn't have picked anything worse. You know, because it's, it's just, it was just, just bad. I just didn't, I, I didn't like it at all. I think you hated it. I did. I, I absolutely hated it. You know, and it has nothing to do with Taz or the FTW belt or Brian Cage. But it was just there. It was the way it was presented that, oh my gosh, we're going to do something absolutely amazing that's going to change the world. No. I'm, I'm about to make you, I'm about to make you love it. There we <laughs> okay. go. That's if they do this, and I don't know that they will, but here's what I would do. Now, just imagine Brian Cage is the MTW World Champion. Next week, he defeats Moxley. He's mm -hmm. the AEW World Champion. Taz is in there celebrating with him. Brian Cage is holding up both belts. Taz is looking at him, cheering him on, and you see Brian Cage drop that MTW belt on the ground and whoop Taz's ass. Hmm. Biggest heel in the game. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. I, I, I would love that. Rips yeah. the heart out of Taz. You get so much heat, heel heat and steam on Brian Cage, and now he's the AEW champion. Biggest heel in the game. But, uh, see, Shane, two weeks ago when we talked about this, you said John Moxley has to stay the champion for a while. Who said that? You did. Oh, I don't know. And it's just like right now, by bringing that title in, it shifts everything around where it's not going to be in John Moxley's favor. You, I want to really go back to, to the detail. I want to go to the detail files where I said he needs to stay champ. I need to hear this. I need to hear this played back because I, I might have been under duress. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the championship to flip flop around too much. Yeah, I will say that. But yeah. You know, if, if it does the way I just said, if that happens, that would be awesome, and I would be in full favor of that. Because then that championship is the main focus of the show, which is what the main focus of any wrestling show should be, 
is that main championship. Now, granted, because they, they're only 52 weeks out of the year, which is almost all of the weeks of the year, there's going to be times <laughs> where it can't be the focus of the show. Is it but it should still be one of the main things that you're fighting for. Without a doubt, should be the AEW World Championship. So it needs to be on somebody, and it needs to be a main storyline, not just any old regular storyline with, you know, no offense, Brody Lee or anything like that, because that did nothing for me. And right now, the Brian Cage thing is kind of hit or miss. But you, Brian Cage needs to leave next Wednesday night the AEW World Champion, without a doubt. Well, you know, it's interesting. You talk about titles being defended in championships and the importance of the AEW World Championship. It should be noted, and the record should reflect in the future, that this actually was a week where the TNT Television Championship was not defended. Was it, wasn't it supposed to be defended every week? Yeah, but here's the clause. Here's the escape clause. So it what's was, the thing I got to do with this? It was, <laughs> it, was, it was week two of Fighter Fest. So it technically wasn't that. Okay. Okay. Just saying, just saying. I'll give, I'll give them that. There's a week lapse. You know, I, I don't like loopholes because they uh, they become a challenge later. But uh, just just throwing that out there. But gentlemen, I want to throw something else out there. As we did with NXT, week two of AEW's Fighter Fest is now in the books, and we have a total of eleven matches that occurred over the two weeks. We also uh, were absent one match that was to happen: that John Moxley versus Brian Cage, as we were just talking about. But summarize your thoughts on the two weeks combined of Fighter Fest from AEW on TNT. What did you think of the overall presentation over the course of the two weeks, Dave Hero? I thought that they had. I thought they did a great job. They featured as many of their stars as they possibly could. When you have that many six mans, that many eight mans, that many just different types of matches, where just about everybody on your roster gets to be seen on TV. I think that's very well done and very creative. I gave, I gave NXT in, in a bash at the beach and a, you know, I'll give AEW a, a B to a B plus <laughs> just because bash at the beach. <laughs> what was that? Did I say bash at the beach? <laughs> well, there was a beach atmosphere. I don't know. But, I mean, I, I mean, AEW, they, they just lacked the sense of urgency, and we didn't see the, la the the sense of urgency until we saw Orange Cassidy against Chris Jericho, as far as I'm concerned. So that's where I give the nod to NXT overall. But AEW, th again, when you have 11 matches and you can get in 90% of your roster, that's impressive. Shane Helms, what were your overall thoughts on the two-week Fighter Fest? Yeah, I did like that so many people were involved. It was very heavily ensembleized, which which I like. You know, I like having a lot of people involved. Uh, but to me, and I, I think we touched on this last week a little bit, it just really seemed like two more weeks of dynamite. It didn't seem like a big event. You know, these two, these last two weeks to me didn't hold any more significance than you know the previous weeks. You know, so it didn't have a big show feel, but there was a lot of good matches. There was a lot of good wrestling. Um, you know, of course, Jericho versus Orange Cassidy, that eight man was absolutely fantastic. You know, SE, uh, there was a lot of good stuff, but it still lacked that that big show feel that, that was missing. And also, you know, and I hate to compare this to WWE because they've had decades of experience. But when you talk about those promo packages that WWE puts together, AEW really needs to. That's an area where, where, where they can st step up the game a little bit. I mean, just looking at what uh, NXT did with that Negan Fox, uh, Io Shirai, that little promo package last night, that was fantastic. That was absolutely fantastic. And I, I want to see that match just because of that promo. AEW, uh, that's an area where, you know, they could really advance their show, shows on a little bit. But, I mean – Overall, I think, you know, we've had a couple of really good weeks of uh, uh, progress on Wednesday night. So um, big wins for both for both for both teams. Does AEW get any extra consideration, though? You talk about fitting the whole roster in the two weeks and getting everybody a shot. Well, Darby Allen didn't, nor did neither did. Uh, did um, God, how is his name escaping me? Um, gosh, he's endorsed in everything. Sean Spears? Sammy, Sammy Gravara. Sammy Gravara. And Sean Spears. Uh, well, 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 you know Sammy's not going to be there anytime soon. No, I'm just saying that they actually had some of their top stars from their roster not available for these last yeah. two weeks for Fighter Fest. 
does that change the opinion at all of what they delivered? Because both of you rank NXT's effort higher. Does AEW get any consolation prizes or uh, um, handicap points, if you will, for having those talents not available? I don't say I would rank their effort higher. You know, I mean, I think the effort was there across the board, sure. but sure. you just the great American bash with the big with the uh, Keith Lee winning both of those championship gave you a big show feel. There was a big show feel to that. And that's what I was looking for. You know, if you're going to promote a big show, I want a big show feel. If it's just going to be a regular show. OK, then you gave me a regular show mm-hmm. feel. But in terms of, of a big event, the Great American Bash just had that big show feel with uh, Keith Lee winning both his championship at the end. Like I said, they could have had that with the uh, the best friends capturing the AEW tag team titles. <laughs> they could have had a moment there. You know? You're still stuck on that, aren't you? Yeah, that I'm, still I'm bothers you. That still bothers me. I think it was uh, it would have been good. But well, you, go ahead, Shane. Um, but there's still there's still so much good stuff going on with both of these companies. So um, you know, and to always keep in mind this ridiculous COVID era that we're living in right now. Um, they're constantly having to modify plans and change plans. So things that might seem odd might have just been done out of desperation because we lost a certain talent or something happened here. There's a lot of weird shit going on right now. So, um, you know, both both teams are really making an, these on the fly adjustments. And some of them nobody knows about, not us and definitely not the fans. You know, so sometimes when we're nitpicky, and I know that's what we do on this show, but we're still grading on the curve. We're grading on the COVID curve right now. And that being said, you know, like I said, my hat's off to both both teams. Well, and you questioned earlier, Shane, why we referred to this as the Super Show or why I changed what I refer to the show as every week when we do it. Well, we're one hour and 16 minutes and 28 seconds. We've got a superhero on the show. And you two want to talk about Impact well, Wrestling. Yeah, let's be fair. You have two superheroes on the show. Let's get no, that straight. We have a super and a hero. Oh, See? okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See what I did there? But like, yeah. ham, like ham and burger. <laughs> Hot and dog. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Impact. Uh, Damien, did you get a chance to watch it? Are you too busy over there in New Jersey? I unfortunately did not get a chance to watch Impact Wrestling. So, in fact, I'm just going to frame this. Actually, I've already framed it. I'm going to step away for a minute and let you two talk about why everyone and more people should be watching Impact Wrestling. Shane, last week you told us we would start talking about it on this show. I love that we are. I'm, it's unfortunate I didn't get a chance to watch, but you and Dave both did, and I want to get schooled as to what I missed and why I should be watching Impact Wrestling. Yeah, I mean, like Dave talked about, that cold opening, that production, man, that – that cold open video was pretty cool. It didn't hurt my feelings that you saw a glimpse of Shane Helms walking down the stage. <laughs> uh, I didn't even know they were going to do that. That was pretty neat. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate them doing that. Um, they just got some really good storylines going on. You know, uh, they're dealing with their own set of circumstance. Uh, they're, they're heavy, their world champion is no longer with the company. So their main event for Slammiversary had a little monkey wrench thrown into the plans. But they seem to be handling it really well. You know, I like what they're doing with Johnny Swinger, who, I mean, this was a guy who worked in WCW. He worked in ECW. He had a brief run in WWE. And his best work is right now. In it is right now. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, Johnny, it's, in, it's incredible. He actually stole the show from me quite a few times, especially with him walking around. First, when he, when he found the Super Eric costume, and yeah. then when he puts on the suicide gimmick, and he's walking around, and then he, like, pulled off the, the mask so you could tell. I forgot who he was talking to. Um, Willie Mack. Yeah, that's right. He's talking to Willie Mack saying, you know, he's 44 or whatever it was. <laughs> just just funny stuff. But, you know, with so much – also with so much women's wrestling on TV, I thought that the knockouts did fantastic. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're right there also. I mean, with the exception of having that huge – crossover star like you know they don't have a Finn Balor or a Chris Jericho or a Matt Hardy or whatever but when you have guys like Moose and Tommy Dreamer doing their thing and you you actually believe it's like it, you can feel it like mm-hmm. you know that they have a a big fight feel but I, I just thought Impact did a really really good job of of, of, of rebuilding their brand is what essentially they're doing is, is the rebuilding everything is let's be honest impacts been on for 18 years. Mm-hmm. 
You know, and there are many a times we didn't think they'd get past five years and 10 years and 15. Now they're almost at 20 years. And they've had a lot of big stars come through there. And I love how now they're teasing for Slammiversary of former world champions coming back. And that could be anybody. You know, it could be Eric Young. It could be Ken Anderson. It could be EC3. There's so many guys um, that, that could be huge Bully possibilities. Ray. Bully, Bully Ray, Ray as well. He yeah. just announced that his Ring of Honor contract uh, is on hiatus or whatever. So uh, I thought he did really well, you know, and they did really good about highlighting some of the past things. I think yeah. that's fascinating, you know, and that's something like on Raw and SmackDown, especially in this area, you could do like, hey, let me show you something to remind you guys of some of the legendary stars that have come, you know, that have walked down this aisle. Now, I, I thought that was really good. Cause, and two, you want to talk about the knockouts before the women's revolution existed in WWE, yeah. Impact was killing it with the knockouts. You yes, know, they were. Uh, you want to talk, and even they showed a match. That's like the beautiful people, uh, you know, in that match with uh, Victoria. I always call her Victoria. I think she was called uh, Tara. Uh, Tara. Tara. Yeah, Tara. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tara there uh, with Lacey Von Erich in the mix, man. Like, and that was good stuff. And that was a packed house in Cincinnati, also. Yeah. I believe yeah. it was Cincinnati. Yeah. And they had a great house. I mean, TNA Impact Wrestling, they had a lot of young studs that just were mismanaged by the corporate offices. And that's what held TNA Impact Wrestling back. But, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, within, within the next couple of years, you see more and more stars coming out of, uh, out of Impact Wrestling and becoming big players. It, it, it's just a matter of time. I was impressed by their production. I think Scott Demore is doing a great job. I believe Cyrus the Virus is still there. Um, but, yeah, they just seem like they are running a professional wrestling company doing professional wrestling things. He prefers to be known as, as Lord Cyrus, by the way. Lord Cyrus. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I thought it was good. I'm, I'm glad I watched it for the first time. I want to say it's been at least a couple of years since I've good. seen it last because I just haven't been able to find it on any of the dials. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. And I didn't realize how much of a beast and a monster Moose really is Dude, until I Moose saw him in the huge, ring. Huge, huge. Yeah. And I think, I think Moose can be even a much bigger star. I love the fact that he went uh, – it's kind of similar to the <laughs> – you know, uh, when I saw Taz bring out the FTW thing, my mind immediately went to Moose – how went and uh, snatched up the TNA championship and then walking around in it. Although it's mm -hmm. completely different, and I doubt Taz got that. I, I doubt that even crossed his mind. But it, it did kind of make me think about that. Uh, if you watch the promos of, like, Trey Miguel, man, his promo was fire talking about the, uh, you know, the the main event of Slammiversary. Him and Ace Austin, this Ace yep. Austin kid, it's really, you know, I, 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 he did a seminar with me. I, I want to think it was for at Harley Races Camp, uh, you know, that kid's really gotten really, really good over the last couple of years, man. They got a and pretty, he's young. pretty, he's really yeah, young, very young. I can talk and, you know, and you believe what he says and that believable promos are, you know, so, so damn essential. Um, so I really like what they're doing, you know, and I'm looking forward to a uh, slammiversary. You know, I was, I'm looking forward to slammiversary just as much as I was looking forward to great American bash of fighter fest. And, you know, it's a shame, you know, they've, they've had a lot, they've had a couple of rough years. They had some really good years, but, um, and they did have some rough ones, you know, so, but I think it's time they like quit, you know, quit hanging on to, you know, past memories, you know, get, give impact a chance, man. Cause right. like I said, as somebody that's been watching closely for, you know, the past couple of months, they're putting on a solid show and it's as good as any, as any wrestling show on TV. And they and and their women's gauntlet match at Slam at Slammiversary, I think, has like fourteen or sixteen girls in it, which I think is a it, it's a big gauntlet match. I think there's like fourteen girls in this gauntlet match. Woo. Yeah, so it's going to be really interesting to see how they put together. I think Tommy Dreamer is a very creative in, individual. I think him and Moose will do some great things, and uh, I'm super curious to see who. The uh, former world champion is going to be that's going to be that fourth person in the match. Eddie Edwards, it's like he's almost timeless, you know. I mean, he he's reinvented himself, but he still looks and he he still looks the same. Yep, and he's good. He's one of those guys. He you can he he's a Brett. He's the Brett Hart of TNA. He's wow. one of those guys you can yeah. put in there with anybody, and it's always going to be good. I mean, there was a point when I mean when Brett first got the title. It wasn't like Brett all of a sudden got good. 
he had been that good for years, mm-hmm. you know. And then it was like, you know, the, the, I guess the Ric Flair thing had kind of whatever, for whatever reason, they wanted to get the title off of Flair. And it really became, hey, Brett's having a good match every night of the week with anybody. Let's go with him. Well, you know, and one of the other things was, is that at that time they were debating WWF, WWE, were debating, did they want to expand more into Canada or more mm-hmm. into Mexico? Mm-hmm. And it was down to between Tito Santana and Bret Hart as to who was going to beat Ric Flair. Imagine mm-hmm. how different things would have been if Tito Santana would have defeated Ric Flair to become the WWF world champion at that time, as opposed to Bret Hart. Yeah, that's... That, I mean, I, they made the right choice. I do love Tito, but at the same yeah. time, you know, and two, and once they gave Brett just that little extra touch of credibility by becoming that world champion, then right then and there, he was one of the best of all time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? And that's back when we were shocked. Like when I heard that Brett, when I got the PWI Weekly newsletter, because I didn't get the Observer, I got the PWI Weekly, and I read that Bret Hart had beaten Ric Flair. I was like, how does that happen? How does the tag team guy who was just intercontinental that, that was just battling with Bad News Brown, now he's the world champion? So it was really cool to watch him grow and morph into the best there is, best there was, best there ever will be. Yep. Gentlemen, uh, sounds like Impact is indeed worthy, is indeed worth watching. Their 16th installment of Slam Aversary comes up on July 18th. They do have lots of teases planned. We've seen a lot of former stars from other companies. Posing with Impact shirts in the case of Carl Anderson recently. We've heard the company itself tease and release a video of the alumni or those who are available who may be coming in. Could that be the turning point? Maybe we'll talk about that next week as we, hey, you know, speaking of next week, are you guys endeavoring to do Be the Booker for Slammiversary? Uh, I, I, I think we have to. If yeah. we're going to talk about it, we might as well talk about it. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. And next week right here on this very program. Be the booker for Impact, Impact Wrestling Slammiversary, which is a uh, oh, and, and don't forget, we still got to talk about Fighter Fest next week too, on this very program for the Fallen. Fight, yeah, that one. <laughs> There's too many fighting shows on on Wednesday nights now. It seems like it's very confusing. It's well, very the Kabuki fight that matters me. is right here on Fight TV, F I T E Fight Fight TV, which you could watch Impact Wrestling on, you could watch Slammiversary on, and uh, be sure to check out. Pro Wrestling Report here as well. We are live on Thursday nights. This show, it's shorter than last week, but longer than we typically want to do. We're currently at an hour 27. I love that. I hope you love it, those of you watching and viewing at home. And be sure to subscribe to the show. Subscribe to us individually on Twitter and social media as well. And never miss an episode of the Pro Wrestling Report on Fight TV. Gentlemen, closing words, closing comments, parting thoughts as we go off the air here on Fight until next Thursday when we preview and book Impact Slammiversary. Dave, we'll we'll start with you. I'm very curious to see what happens on SmackDown and very curious to see what happens on Raw. It looks like that pay-per-view Extreme Rules Horror Show is going to be a movie of a pay-per-view because when you have guys ripping out eyeballs and (laughs) having matches in swamps, I'm yeah. terrified as to how overproduced that show is going to be. Shane, what do you say? Yeah, that's going to be when I saw that uh, the winner can only win the match if, when he pulls his opponent's eyeball out. Uh, yeah. You know what, though? You know, <laughs> what, was, you know, uh, what, you know what I thought was cool about that? That's a pretty extreme stipulation. What's that? What I thought was cool is that Jimmy Jack Funk is the guest timekeeper right? and, Haku, and Haku is the special guest referee. So someone's eye is going to be knocked out. <laughs> Mike, I think they're bringing in Michael Bisbing for commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, PCO from Ring of Honor might be doing a run-in. That's, uh... <laughs> of course. Of course. Well, thanks, guys, and thank you all for joining us, all of the world, here on Fight TV. Be sure to remember you can take this show with you in podcast form, and uh, you can search all of your favorite podcast channels and get PWR Primetime with Hurricane Helms. That's how you find it on your favorite podcast channels and take us with you on the go. For, uh, in the meantime, rather, for Shane Helms, the superstar Shane Helms, Hurricane <laughs> Helms, the star of this program. Uh, Bill, you as great at the end as I did at the beginning. Oh, there he is. Of course he is. 
<laughs> that one, David Hero. This is Damian Nelson saying thank you for joining us here on Primetime Live. We'll see you on Saturday night for the Primetime Weekend Edition.